Hi, my name is Katie Connor. I've been working in PA education for about 10 years now. I'm also an orthopedic surgery PA in Charleston, South Carolina. Today, we're going to be talking about the psychiatry unit. This is part of our 13-part series to help make didactic care a little bit easier and help you to ace your boards. Let's take a look at the objectives for this unit. I've separated them out into five main categories, and the first category that we'll talk about is going to be anxiety disorders. The first anxiety disorder that we'll talk about is going to be obsessive compulsive disorder. In obsessive compulsive disorder, I want to skip down here to the etiology first. This is due to an abnormal serotonin neurotransmission, and it's a twofold disorder. The first part is that the patient experiences obsessions that are persistent, intrusive thoughts that cause them a great deal of anxiety. In order to neutralize those, they develop compulsions or repeated rituals that help to neutralize or bring down that anxiety that they experience from the obsessions. Let's go look at the history here now. The difference between obsessive compulsive disorder and obsessive compulsive personality disorder is that people with OCD recognize that they have the problem and wish they could stop. People with obsessive compulsive personality disorder do not recognize that they have the disease, so they have no desire to stop. Some of the more common obsessions that we see, contamination, so the fear of germs or being dirty, symmetry or asymmetry, doubting their memory, safety, did I lock the door, fear of throwing things away or wasting them, and then fear of committing a sin. Here are the common compulsions that we see to neutralize those obsessions. So constantly cleaning their house, their hands, their body, arranging objects so that they look symmetrical, making lists because they're constantly doubting their memory, checking things over and over, locking that front door three or four times, hoarding things. These are the people who hoard everything. They can't throw them away because, they're fear of, because of their fear of wasting things. And then constantly going to confessional because of their fear of committing a sin. Physical exam findings for a lot of the psychiatric disorders are kind of nonspecific, but three that we may see on this one. Eczema, they're constantly washing their hands. Their hands are kind of ruddy or red, kind of peeling, flaking. Hair loss on their dominant hand side, trictylomania because they're pulling it out. And then excoriations from chronic skin picking. About 3% of Americans have OCD and the onset starts at about age 10, but 10s to 20s is where we see this. There are various different types of scales that you can use to help diagnose this, but one of the more common one is called the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale. And you go through with the patient and kind of take an inventory of what their symptoms are and it helps you to diagnose this. For this disorder and every disorder that we talk about in this unit, behavioral therapy is just as important as medications. If we wanna give our patients the best possible outcome, we need to do both, not just throw a pill at it and say bye. Cognitive behavioral therapy helps, to, helps that medication to work together synergistically to help this patient get better. So two of the medications, clomipramine is a, is a uh, tricyclic antidepressant that helps to increase the serotonin levels. SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. This is kind of gonna be the first line for a lot of the disorders that we'll see in this unit. So things like Zoloft, Prozac, those are common. And then cognitive behavioral therapy, exposing them to the thing that gives them the anxiety and teaching them how to correctly respond to that. Desensitization, you're exposing them to smaller and then larger and larger amounts until their brain kind of gets used to that and becomes comfortable with experiencing that situation. Generalized anxiety disorder. This can be due to one of two things. Number one, it could be a learned cause. So some kind of conditioning to external stimuli. For example, if a child was bitten by a dog um, they may have that fear as an adult or have anxiety around dogs as an adult. There's also a biologic etiology for this. A deficiency in GABA, a neurotransmitter, can certainly cause generalized anxiety disorder or contribute to this. In generalized anxiety disorder, we take a normal response such as fear and worry and we make it pathologic. So let's walk through kind of those four step ways from normal to pathologic. 
Fear, that's in green because it's normal. It's a normal amount of unpleasant feelings in response to a realistic danger. For example, let's say I'm out gardening and I look down and I see a copperhead snake, which is venomous. And I'm afraid of that. That's a normal amount of unpleasant feelings in response to a realistic danger. If I get bitten by that snake, I'm probably gonna end up in the hospital. Then we go down to worry. Worry is still normal, but fearful thoughts about a realistic danger. So every time I'm in the garden now, I'm looking down to make sure that I don't see any type of venomous snakes. I'm being more careful because I'm a little worried that I might see one. Now we move down into the pathologic process. So anxiety. This is an exaggerated, unpleasant apprehension regarding a realistic or an unrealistic danger. I have anxiety now every time I go into my garden, I'm constantly looking down because I might see a non-venomous snake or a venomous snake, and I'm just not feeling comfortable with that, and I don't even know if I want to garden anymore. Now we go even more pathologic to a phobia. Phobia is extreme fear-mediated avoidance of a realistic or an unrealistic danger. I'm not going to garden anymore. I've given up gardening. I don't even want to go near my garden, and I don't even want to look at pictures of people gardening because I might think about that snake and that gives me that anxiety. So generalized anxiety disorder is pathologic. It's not fear. In history for this, so tense body, heart racing, diarrhea, leaving situations due to panic, socially avoidant and insomnia because they're having that constant anxiety. On physical exam, these are not specific to this disorder but commonly seen in this disorder. Nail biting, very pressured speech, they may be sweaty, kind of have a paranoid affect, dark under eye circles because they're not sleeping. And then we know anxiety can certainly be a cause of hypertension. Females are more common for generalized anxiety disorder and this typically presents in the early 20s. The diagnostic criteria, I wanna make an important point before we go through these. In the next few slides here, you're gonna see that there's a lot of timelines. The timelines are important. How long has the patient had these symptoms? Six months is gonna be a key criteria for a lot of these, but this is not just that they had this for one day and it's over. So make sure you are aware of what the timeline is and then what the required symptoms are. So let's go through this one. Anxiety causes significant impairment on most days of their life. This has been present for at least six months. There's your timeline. And they must have at least three of the following symptoms, restlessness, distractibility, irritability, muscle tension, and insomnia. So those are key points there. Treatment, we have our behavioral therapy component and our medication component. So cognitive behavioral therapy can include graded exposure, so small amounts, flooding, large amounts, SSRIs or beta blockers. If this is something that they encounter in their lives on a regular basis, you can put them on a preventative for this. So our SSRIs would be a first line. Beta blocker can slow the heart rate and help with that anxiety. Buspirone is short-term only, and then benzodiazepines. This class of medications can be addictive, things like Xanax, Clonopin. So if the patient has a history of substance use disorder, they're contraindicated, you don't write for those. Acute stress disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. I wanna go down to the bottom line here in the criteria where it says acute stress disorder, is two days to four weeks, and then it becomes PTSD. So the only difference between these two disorders is the timeline. Acute stress disorder becomes PTSD. In this disorder, there is a traumatic event that has occurred to the patient. So a traumatic event with actual or threatened death or harm. This next point is key. The patient believes that their life is now shortened because of this event. When they had a response to the event, it included fear or helplessness in a very intense way. After that event, the patient starts to experience these symptoms. Flashbacks, they replay it over and over in their mind. Avoidance of associated stimuli. Let's say they were mugged at a bus stop. Maybe they avoid public transportation altogether. Hypervigilance, they're constantly looking around waiting for something else bad to happen. And this has to be present for at least one month. Detachment, they become socially isolated. Derealization, they believe that the world around them is not real. Depersonalization, they feel like they are not real. They are automated, they are inhuman, they are robotic. And then dissociative amnesia, they actually cut out a chunk of their memory surrounding that event. 
Here's diagnostic criteria, at least three of the following, shock, anhedonia, they don't wanna do things that used to bring them joy. Regression is something that we see more commonly in children. They'll go back to more baby-like activities. Distrust of others, nightmares, self-blame, insomnia, exaggerated startle. You go to pat them on the back and they feel like they are going to hurt them. Change in appetite, overeating or undereating. Change in libido and social withdrawal. So get all of those symptoms, but for acute stress disorder, acute, it's two days to four weeks after the event. Then we go into PTSD. On physical exam, nonspecific but common, unkept weight loss or weight gain, an anxious affect and irritability. They're not getting a whole lot of sleep. Everything's harder when you don't sleep. Here's a good exam question. What is the most common event that leads to PTSD? And the answer is rape. 33 or a third of rape victims will get PTSD, but other common things that can incite this. War, death, murder, injury, loss of home, assault, robbery, motor vehicle crash, kidnapping, drowning, domestic violence, sexual abuse, mass casualty incidents. Some of you may be too young to remember 9-11, but a lot of us witnessed on TV those planes flying into the towers. Although we were not in New York to directly experience that, a lot of people experienced PTSD-like symptoms because it's all about how your brain perceives the event, not that you're actually there. And then finally, divorce. Who is the most common group to get PTSD? The answer to that is soldiers. That's a good exam question. So 30% of soldiers because of the horrors of war. Back in World War II, when a lot of those soldiers came back, we didn't really understand a whole lot about mental health. And a lot of those soldiers went on to become chronic alcoholics and drug abusers because they were trying to medicate. We're really trying to do a much better job now with our soldiers coming back who've seen the horrors of war to protect their mental health. 20% of, of patients will develop other psychological comorbidities. So irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, depression, suicidality, and substance abuse because they're trying to self-medicate. Therapy for this can include relaxation, exposure therapy, and support groups. SSRIs are gonna be our first line medication for this one. Benzodiazepines, if it's very, very severe, but again, contraindicated with a history of substance abuse. And then Seroquel is a medication that is specifically used to treat the nightmares associated with PTSD. Panic disorder. This is a disorder in which the patient will experience panic attacks. This is a genetically correlated disorder and it's an exa exaggerated response to fear. So it's a fear of fear. And the triggers for this can include injury, illness, any type of conflict or stress, drugs like cannabis or stimulants, and then social situations. When the patient is having a panic attack, the way that they may describe that, they feel like they have chest pain, shortness of breath, dizziness, they feel like they're choking or not getting enough air, numbness around their mouth or in their hands, fear that they are going crazy or that they're going to die, an urge to flee, derealization, the world is not real around them, depersonalization, they feel like they are not in the world, they are not real. On physical exam, tachycardia, tachypnea, diaphoresis, they're sweaty. Key point here, there are a lot of other things that can cause tachycardia, tachypnea, and diaphoresis that can kill you. This should be on the last of your differential after you've ruled out myocardial infarction, thyroid storm, pulmonary embolus, and asthma attack. Make sure you've ruled those out first. The key point for panic disorder is that the panic attack will develop abruptly, peak within about 10 minutes, and then start to resolve, whereas those other disorders will not resolve after 10 minutes. For the diagnostic for this, they have to have at least one monthly panic attack. So this has to be occurring on a frequent basis, at least once a month. Treatment for this, cognitive behavioral therapy. Talk about this, the triggers that give you those panic attacks. SSRIs, if this patient experiences something that gives them panic on a regular basis, let's say they, they, they get panic when they fly, they get a panic attack when they get on an airplane. If they travel for a living, an SSRI would be appropriate. 
But if they're only going on a plane once every five years, and that's the only thing that gives them a panic attack, an SSRI is overkill. Benzodiazepines would be a more appropriate treatment option for that patient if they don't have a history of substance abuse. So if it's known triggers or rare situa situations, you can give a benzodiazepine. If it's something that occurs frequently for them, an SSRI would be a more appropriate first-line therapy. Social anxiety disorder. Let's look down at the etiology first for that one. This is a fear of social situations. And an etiology that's even more rare, social anxiety disorder, agoraphobia. This is a severe social anxiety disorder where they have an extreme fear of public places and they actually do not leave their house because they're so paralyzed with fear. So in the history, they have a fear of embarrassment, humiliation, or criticism of themselves in a social situation. So they will either just completely avoid the social situations or they will endure them with great distress. On physical exam, they appear anxious. They're kind of sweaty. They speak kind of softly. They kind of hide over in the corner of the room. If you shake their hands, their hands are kind of sweaty or clammy. And then the tachycardia, their heart is racing. 12% of people have social anxiety disorder. That's, that's relatively common. Agoraphobia, 7%, much less common. We start to see the symptoms of social anxiety disorder at age 10. Here's our diagnostic criteria. They must have these symptoms for at least six months. That's our timeline. They are aware that their fear is unreasonable. Common situations that give them that anxiety, so all socially related, meeting new people, talking to their bosses, using public restrooms or transportation, going on dates, going to parties, going into a full room, talking with strangers, being the center of attention, these are not the people that you want to sing them happy birthday in the middle of a restaurant that will not bring them joy. Eating or drinking in front of others and then participating in team sports. All of those are common situations that give them anxiety. Behavioral therapy. Two kind of specific ones is social training, pretending like you're on a date. This is how you start a conversation. These are questions that you can ask people. This is how you can eat and feel comfortable about that. Role playing, pretending like you're in those situations. SSRIs, if this is something that's very common and debilitating for them, that's a good first line therapy. Benzodiazepines, again, if that trigger is rare or if they don't have any history of substance abuse. So let's say that they only get social anxiety disorder when they have to get up in front of a class and give a talk. That would be an example of where a benzodiazepine would be more appropriate than an SSRI. Now we're finally going to move on to phobia. Remember, phobia was all the way down on that pathology when we talked about fear. In phobias, about 95% of phobias start in relation to some kind of traumatic childhood event. So let's say something like a dog bite. There is an evolutionarily protective component of a phobia. Somebody who has a fear of venomous snakes, venomous spiders, the dark, these are all things that increase the likelihood of death. You know, more people have their homes robbed at nighttime. Um, venomous snakes can certainly kill people. These are things that, that stem from an evolutionary fear. So they had their groundings in something that's rational. It's just that this person takes that way beyond that original rational fear. So in phobias, when the patient is exposed to the thing that gives them anxiety, terror, sheer terror, children may cry or cling to someone. They may freeze. They may throw tantrums. As soon as they see that thing, their heart starts racing. They start breathing faster. Hypertension spikes. They may get sweaty. Here are the most common etiologies. We divide these up into a couple categories here. Animal related. Dogs, cats, bees, spiders, snakes. Those are very common. I want to point here, if you have an anaphylactic reaction to bees, that might be a good thing to have a phobia of because that increases your likelihood for death. Environmental stressors, heights, water, thunderstorms, blood injection injuries, any type of needle or medical procedure, and then situational, flying, elevators, enclosed spaces. Those are all very common. So here's our diagnostic criteria. Fear out of proportion to the actual danger of the stimulus. It's way beyond the rational fear. This leads to avoidance, distress, and impairment for the patient. The patient is very aware, aware that their fear is excessive. And the duration, there's your key timeline, is six months. Treatment for this. 
behavioral therapy is key. So desensitizing them to that item that gives them stress. Graded exposure, smaller, medium, larger amounts. Flooding is where you kind of just put them, throw them in the pool, as they say. SSRIs, if it's frequent, we talked about if somebody has to travel for a living and they have a phobia of flying, an SSRI would be an appropriate first line therapy. A beta blocker or a benzodiazepine, let's say they just have a phobia of taking a test, maybe you give them that medication only at the time that they have or they're going to be exposed to that item that gives them anxiety. So behavioral is key in this one. Here's the most common and the most commonly tested phobias. So the way that this may appear on your exam is they just give you the word and say, what is this a fear of? Agoraphobia is a fear of public places, arachnophobia is spiders, ophidiophobia is snakes, glossophobia is public speaking, claustrophobia, tight spaces, sinophobia is dogs, aerophobia is flying, xenophobia is strangers, nyctophobia is dark, acrophobia is heights, trypanophobia is needles, hemophobia is blood, and then ornithophobia, as you can see in this picture here, is birds. That was all of our anxiety disorders. Let's move on to our psychoses. We're going to start with schizophrenia, but I'm gonna move us down to the etiology here first because this one can be confusing. There's a lot of disorders that sound like schizophrenia. So let's break them down. Schizophrenia has a genetic component. We know that we can demonstrate that they have brain abnormalities. They have larger ventricles and smaller uh, thalamus in the brain than a normal person. This can also be due to maternal malnourishment or influenza while that patient was in utero. They also have abnormally functioning dopamine receptors. So there are some biological components to this. Let's talk about the history and the physical, and then we're gonna skip back down to the etiology. The history, the patient usually comes in with a family member that says they've been kind of hallucinating, responding to non-existent stimuli, socially becoming isolated, socially becoming awkward. They develop suspicious, they just develop a suspicious affect of others. So they're afraid of others or they're suspicious. A lot of people with schizophrenia actually take up smoking because it helps with the cognition. It increases their natural levels of dopamine. The physical exam findings, thought blocking, they abruptly pause during a conversation and then completely start on a different subject. Tangential speech, this is a train of thought that kind of wanders. You may say, what's your favorite food? And they say, food, plate, silverware, fork, cup, and they kind of go off on this tangential speech. Tardive dyskinesia is a physical exam finding that is not associated with schizophrenia, but it's associated with the medications, the antipsychotic medications that we use to treat schizophrenia, lip smacking. That is an example of tardive dyskinesia. Echolalia, where the patient repeats what is said to them, and then a very flat affect. They don't show a lot of emotions. So those are the history and the physical exam findings that we're going to talk about now. Brief psychotic disorder. This is where the patient has those symptoms from one day to one month. Schizophreniform disorder. Now we're going from one month to six months, same symptoms. After six months, it now becomes schizophrenia. So same disorder, same history, same physical exam findings. Brief psychotic disorder, then you have schizophreniform disorder, then you have schizophrenia. So it's all the matter of the timeline. Schizoaffective disorder is when they have both symptoms of schizophrenia and a mood disorder. So we know an affective disorder is a mood disorder. So depression plus schizophrenic symptoms. Schizophrenia is relatively rare. We start to see symptoms kind of in the late teens to the early 20s. Here's our diagnostic criteria. We have to have at least two symptoms for at least six months in order to get that diagnosis of schizophrenia. So our positive symptoms, things that they are doing delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech or behavior. We talked about all those in the history. Negative symptoms, things that they're not doing that they should be doing. No emotions, no activities of daily living like brushing their teeth, poor hygiene, no motivation, minimal speech, and poor abstract thinking. So we have to have at least two of those for at least six months in order to have that diagnosis for schizophrenia. The treatment for schizophrenia is antipsychotic medications. We have first generation and second generation. 
as is true with most medications, first generations are well covered by insurance, but they tend to have a lot more side effects like that tardive dyskinesia. Haloperidol would be an example of that one. Second generations tend to be more tolerated well, so they don't have as many side effects, but less covered by insurance. Risperidone would be an example of that one. Delusional disorder. In delusional disorder, let's skip down to the, the diagnostic criteria first. They must have symptoms of delusions that are somewhat realistic for at least one month. There's our timeline. But their daily function is unimpaired. Their delusion is not caused by a mood disorder. Um, it's not caused by schizophrenia, and it's not caused by drug or alcohol use. So it's something that is not induced by something else. In delusional disorder, there are five main types. Let's start with erotomaniac. This is where the patient believes that someone of higher social status or somebody who's married or unavailable in a relationship is secretly in love with them. They may send letters, gifts, call repeatedly and stalk their, their, their um, person that they are in love with. An example of this would be John Hinckley, who tried to assassinate President Reagan because he thought that Jodie Foster would be in love with him if he did that. Jealous, they believe that their lover is unfaithful. So their partner and their perceived lover becomes targets of violence. An example of this that was relatively got a lot of news press was a, a lady called Lisa Nowak in 2007. She was a NASA employee that put on some adult diapers and drove 900 miles to see her lover and, their, and the perceived mistress so that she could assault them. Grandiose, this patient believes that they have a unique talent or they've made an important discovery they have a relationship with a celebrity, they're constantly name dropping, or they were given some kind of religious insight. David Koresh was a leader of a cult back in the early 90s. He'd be a good example of this one. Persecutory, they believe that they're being persecuted by their friends, their family, <clears throat> the government. They believe that the bad things that happen to them are never their fault. It's the result of a conspiracy all the time. And then somatic, we know that somata is body related. So they believe that their body is infested with insects, their body emits some kind of foul odor or their body parts are misshapen or defective. Treatment for this relies heavily on cognitive behavioral therapy. Also antipsychotic medications um, are a good first line therapy for somebody with delusional disorder, depending on how much it actually interferes with their life. Dissociative disorders, we've kind of mentioned some of these already, but there's four main dissociative disorder categories. The first one is dissociative identity disorder, also called multiple personality disorder. This is where the patient has two or more distinct identities or personality states, and those identities will take control of the person's behavior recurrently. The patient cannot recall what happens when they're in one personality in something that happened with another personality. And this cannot be explained by forgetfulness or dementia. So this is where they have distinct personalities. Dissociative amnesia, we talked about this one when we talked about PTSD. This is one or more episodes where the patient has an inability to recall any information about a traumatic or stressful event. They literally excise that event from their memory timeline. Derealization or depersonalization disorder. We talked about these that can be associated with PTSD as a defense mechanism. They feel like the objects of the external environment are changing size and shape, that the world around them is not real. They feel that people are automated or inhuman. And if they're depersonalizing, they feel that way about themselves. Dissociative fugue is very rare. They've made uh, other movies out of this, like The Majestic where somebody has this traumatic event and without warning or planning, they travel far from home and they leave behind a past life. They cannot remember anything about that past life. For example, if somebody's being forced to marry somebody they don't want to marry, you may have a dissociative view where they run away to a completely different country. They cannot remember anything about their past. They don't know why they ran away. Uh, they may take on a completely new identity, but that is actually very rare. Now let's move on to our eating disorders. We're gonna start off with obesity. Obesity is a huge problem, especially in America where a third of people are overweight or obese. In obesity, the etiology of this, let's look at that first. High caloric intake, very sedentary lifestyle, genetics can play a role in this. 
This is an excellent board question coming up. What are the most common medications implicated in weight gain? Valproic acid, also called Depakote, Depo-Provera, that's a birth control, steroid medications, and insulin. The comorbidities that, that exist with obesity, depression and substance abuse. A lot of times people are trying to eat their feelings. Complications that can occur in relation to prolonged obesity, hypertension, diabetes, sleep apnea, incontinence, osteoarthritis, <clears throat> fatty liver disease, surgical complications like dehiscence. In the history of obesity, the patient will usually state that they eat alone because they're embarrassed, they feel guilty after they overeat, they impulsively eat, they eat way beyond when they feel full, they intake high caloric foods, so lots of fast foods, lots of desserts, sweetened drinks like colas, or in the South, sweet tea is a huge thing. Sedentary lifestyle, they don't like to exercise, and they eat not because they're hungry, but because they're stressed, they're bored, or they're emotional. On physical exam, we're gonna talk about the BMI classifications in just one second, but intertriginous rashes, where they have the skin folds, they can get candida buildup. Skin tags are more commonly associated with obesity. And then lymphedema, because they're not draining their fluids properly, so they get this kind of buildup and edematous lower extremities. Um, BMI is how we diagnose this. So let's go through the classifications. BMI 25 to 30 is considered overweight. BMI 30 to 35 is considered obese. 35 to 40 is severe obesity. 40 to 45 or 35 with obesity related health conditions like diabetes. That's called morbid obesity. And then finally, 45 to 50 is called super obesity. So these are the classes that would make an excellent exam question there. How do we treat this? Well, one of the biggest parts of our job as PAs is counseling. Counseling them on proper diet, DASH diet, low carb, Mediterranean. There's a lot of good diets out there that are relatively easy to follow. Exercise is also important. 150 minutes a week is where we really start to see a difference in weight loss. Psychotherapy, things like, um, things like intense therapy to talk through why they're eating or things like hypnosis can, can be used. Weight loss program, there's tons of them. Nutrisystem, Jenny Craig, Weight Watchers, Noom. All of these focus on the behavioral aspects of obesity, trying to uncover why they are eating the way they're eating or why they're eating so much. Bariatric surgeries can be indicated. Medications like phenamine, Orlistat, phenamine to pyramate, lorcaserin, naltrexone bupropion. Uh, there's lots of medications that are going to be coming out, you know, especially these last two. These are newer medications on the market. The problem is insurance doesn't usually cover these. Um, so sometimes it can be a challenge to get that patient medication. But remember that medication does not change the behavior. So you can't just tell them to go on phenamine and they'll lose a bunch of weight. You have to address the behavioral component of that as well. Anorexia. So obesity is overeating. Anorexia is now undereating. Let's go to the etiology of this first. The restricting type of anorexia is going to be the most common, but there is a binging and purging type. Typically patients with anorexia have low self-esteem, they're perfectionists, and they have some kind of social pressure. The precipitants for anorexia can be separation, conflict, illness, abuse, criticism about their weight, especially as a child. Sometimes they feel like that's the only thing that they have control in their life over is their weight. On the history for this one, fear of weight gain, a very distorted body image. They look in the mirror and say, oh my goodness, I'm so fat when they look like this. Denial about having an eating disorder. Amenorrhea, because fat secretes estrogen. If you don't have enough fat, you'll stop getting your period. So amenorrhea. Excessive exercise. They're running five miles a day. They're cold intolerance. Why? Because they have no fatty layer to insulate them. Frequently weighing in, getting on the scale 10 times a day. This is a key point here. They spend about 90% of their time thinking about food and their weight. This is gonna be different when we come to bulimia. So remember 90% for anorexia. On physical exam findings, obviously if you look at this patient, you can tell that they have an eating disorder. But in the earlier stages, BMI under 18.5, that's as soon as you cross that threshold, that's where we start thinking about this. They may experience bruising because they have decrease in platelets. Lanugo is kind of baby fine hair that starts to grow on the face. We don't know why they get this, but we think that it's due to the body's way of trying to conserve heat. 
they may have brittle hair or nails because they're malnourished. So their hair and nails don't matter if their organs aren't getting enough nutrition. And then hypotension because they're usually also severely dehydrated. Epidemiology for this one. Onset typically starts in the early teens, so 13 to 18. Females are gonna be 10 times more likely for this. Caucasians have a 95% incidence of, over other ethnic populations. High risk populations, think about a lot of social pressures for these. Dancers, long distance runners, skaters, models, actors, wrestlers, gymnasts, college sorority members, and then homosexual and bisexual male. There's a lot of social pressures for those groups to look and be thin. Diagnosis for this, they refuse to maintain their healthy body weight, so they're less than 85% of expected. Things that we might see on a CBC, anemias, leukopenias, thrombocytopenias, their body's malnourished, it doesn't have the building blocks to make those cells. Decrease in sodium, magnesium, potassium, increased in cortisol because their body is constantly in this malnourished state and they're stressed. Increased in liver function tests if they are going into organ failure because of being malnourished. Decrease in estrogen because they have no fat cells. And then if they are using laxatives, they may also have a positive hemocult, stool hemocult, because they're chronically irritating um, that area. Treatment for this, you wanna restore healthy body weight and correct those electrolyte abnormalities because it's the electrolyte abnormalities that ultimately lead to what we see as cause of death for anorexia. This may require forced nasogastric feedings, inpatient behavioral therapy. SSRIs are used to control the emotional component of this. Megase is an ap appetite stimulant that's used to kind of get them to be more hungry. Here's the death rate. So 10% die from arrhythmia, starvation, liver, and renal failure. Bulimia. Let's talk about with bulimia, let's go to etiology first. Binging, purging, and then non-purging. So the binging is going to be where they get large amounts of high caloric foods in a very short time. And then they purge. They vomit 90% of the time, but they can also use laxatives, enemas, and diuretics. The non-purging type, which is more of the restrictive type, is going to be excessive exercise, thyroid hormones, diet pills, and stimulants that they may be abusing to try to lose weight. So the history, binge eating, lots of high caloric foods in a short amount of time. They go to the bathroom immediately after eating because they're going to vomit. Their self image is dependent on their weight and they have a fear of gaining weight, very similar to anorexia. But here's the key difference. Remember anorexia is 90% of their life thinking about food. This is less, 70% thinking about food. On physical exam, there's a couple specific ones here. In bulimics, they are not very thin. They typically have normal or high BMI because of that high caloric intake. Parotid swelling because they're constantly vomiting. They get this kind of chipmunk cheek. Erosions on the dorsal hand, that's called the Russell sign because that's how they're making themselves vomit. And then dental erosion because they're chronically having acid from the, the vomit coming up into their mouth. Females are just as likely on this one as they are for anorexia. So a high risk group there, age 18 to 20, a little later in onset. Same high risk populations that we talked about anorexia. Again, huge social pressures to maintain weight or have low weight. So dancers, long distance runners, everything that we talked about in the last slide there is high risk groups also for bulimia. Diagnose, they binge, purge to prevent weight gain at least two times a week for at least three months. There's our timeline. So twice a week for at least three months. The electrolyte abnormalities are from the recurrent vomiting. So sodium, magnesium, potassium. How do we treat this one? That behavioral therapy and then Prozac. Here's a really good exam question for this one. Do not give these patients bupropion because they usually have these electrolyte abnormalities. So they are lower threshold for seizures. If you give them Wellbutrin or bupropion, you can send them into a seizure. So that's a good exam question. Bupropion or Wellbutrin is uh, contraindicated in these patients. Death can occur from arrhythmia, renal failure, bore heave esophageal rupture because they're constantly vomiting. That is all for the first part of psychiatry. I hope that was helpful for you. If you're interested in learning more, we have two options for you. If you'd like to just hear the remainder of the review um, and get the PDF of the slides, that's $20. If you'd like to learn even more and help you ace your test, um, there's exams that we can do both on a didactic level and a board level. You'll also have a clinical pearls exercise. So let me show you what those look like real quick. 
Clinical pearls just looks at the importance of matching repetitive, repetitive, repetitive. We take the most common things that are that are que that questions ask you about those diagnoses and you match it to the diagnosis. For your exams, we have two different levels. The didactic level is a moderate level difficulty. So similar for what you would take in your didactic year, there's four answer choices. You'll get an email for anything that you miss so that you can go back and study that for the actual test. And then we have the board level test here. This is designed to be board level difficulty with kind of several steps that you must mentally go through in that question. There's five answer choices. And again, you'll be emailed anything that you answered incorrectly. I wanna thank you for watching this. I hope that this helped for you. They make me say that this is not for diagnostic purposes. This is solely for educational purposes. If you enjoyed this, please leave us some feedback and, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And I hope to see you for part two. I hope you have a great rest of your day.